W. Turntine Jackson, professor of Western U.S. history, University of California at Davis. Where he teaches and writes about immigration, environmental issues, and demographic impacts in the West. Professor Warren grew up in Las Vegas, attended Columbia, undergraduate work, and then he graduated, uh, his graduate studies at Yale University. He's a specialist in environmental history and the editor of American Environmental History, published in 2003. The author of The Hunter's Game, Cultures and Conservationists in 20th Century America, published in 1997, which won the Western Heritage Award in the Western Heritage Center. His highly acclaimed book, Buffalo Bills America, William Cody and the Wild West Show, published in 2007, received the prestigious Beverage Prize from the American Historical Association, the Western Writers of America Spur Award, and the Coy Prize from the Western History Association for the best book in Western history published in 2007. His lecture this evening, A Hole in the Dream, The Ghost Dance and the Making of Modern America, will acquaint us with his current research. Please join me in welcoming Professor Warren. that lovely introduction. Thank you all for, for having me here. It's, it's a great honor to be uh, giving this lecture as a guest of the Red Center, one of the great centers for the study of Western history, as uh, one of the centers of this great and useful and important work in the Western history center. Uh, but the Red Center is one of the other things from a lot longer than the Red Center. My talk tonight is about the ghost thing. And the ghost dance, I will be covering much of this in some detail, but it's probably the best known of uh, the episodes of what is commonly called millennial movements among American Indians. The ghost dance is a moment in 1890 uh, when Indian peoples across the West began to do a dance, a ritual dance, which was meant to bring about a renewed earth and the resurrection of uh, at least an Indian dead. Now there's much more to this dance than what I would told you, and much more to the ritual and to this belief. Um, but this moment was a moment of high crisis for the American government, and it's typically seen as the end of the frontier. It's a, it's a moment that shows up in a lot of textbooks. This is a picture, a photograph, uh, that is commonly captioned ghost dancers at Pine Ridge is the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. It's one of the most famous pictures of the ghost dance. Uh, in fact, just to give you a sense of how wrong-headed much of what we think we know about the ghost dance really is, just to give you a sense of how little I think we actually know still all these years later, these people are likely not ghost dancers at all. Uh, these men are probably, uh, they're probably dressed for an Omaha dance or brass dance, which was a social dance, a sort of dance of celebration and welcome. Uh, the ghost dance is something quite different, and the picture itself has been mistranslated. I'm going to be talking tonight about this area. That the, the area in the red line, of course, demarcates the Great Basin, where we are tonight. Uh, it's that vast area of the inland west where the waters all flow towards internal basins like the Great Salt Lake rather than out to the sea. The landscape of the place I'm going to be talking about is much of the, of the talk concerns Nevada and where the ghost dance came from. Typically, when we tell the story of the ghost dance, we tell the story of the ghost dance on the Great Plains. But as I'll be talking to you tonight, the ghost dance came from Nevada at a place called Walker River, um, which, and, and this, the, the map here is called Wovoka's Homeland. Uh, Wovoka is the name of the prophet who first envisions at least this iteration of the ghost dance. The landscape looks like this uh, in this area of Nevada. It's that classic basin and range. Uh, and that, through my car window, that photograph of those trees, that is the sort of oasis that is the Walker River Paiute Indian Reservation today at Shures, Nevada. That's where much of the action in the early part of my talk unfolds. That's, that's just a few images of introductory material to kind of get you oriented. And other than that, what I will do 
is begin with a story about this man. Jack Wilson died on New Year's Day, 1889, cutting wood in the mountains. He was not far from his home at Walker River Indian Reservation in northern Nevada when he heard a loud rumbling noise. The sun grew dim and the chill descended. He knew no more. When he awoke, he found himself in the other world, as he later put it. There, as this Paiute Indian ranch hand later explained, he saw God with all the people who had died long ago engaged in their old-time sports and occupations, all happy and forever young. It was a pleasant land and full of game. But Jack Wilson was not to remain there. After taking him around paradise, God told him he must go back and tell his people they must be good and love one another have no quarreling and live in peace with the whites, that they must work and not lie or steal, that they must put away all the old practices that savored of war. If they did all this, they would at last be reunited with their friends in this other world where there would be no more death or sickness or old age. Then God promised something better. He promised to turn the exhausted earth into heaven itself. He showed Wilson a new dance and instructed him to teach it to the living. If people danced and lived properly, they could bring heaven to earth and thereby secure this happiness to themselves without having to die. Wilson awoke, descended from the mountains, and began to teach. Photographs of Wilson show a muscular, broad-shouldered man, nearly six feet tall with an open, smiling face, often beneath a broad-brimmed hat. Looking at him, it is easy to believe Paiute accounts of his vigor and skill as a woodsman, qualities which perhaps explain his Paiute name, Wovoka, the Cutter. As a child, he was adopted by a white rancher. This is Wovoka, late in life, uh, in, well, not fairly late in life, in 1914. As a child, he was adopted by a white rancher, David Wilson, who worked him hard, as he did his own sons. The rancher called him Jack and sat him with his family at the breakfast table for daily Bible readings. The earliest picture we have of Jack Wilson is this one, when he's 16 years old and he's standing on the far left there um, with all of those ladies in front of a building uh, in Nevada, and this is probably about 1875. Notice the hat on his head. The hat, the broad brimmed hat, becomes something of Jack Wilson's trademark throughout his life. I don't, I don't actually know why, it's his trademark, uh, but it's one of these things, that the symbol that he, that he comes to associate with himself. The, the rancher, as I mentioned, called him Jack and sat, sat him with his family at the breakfast table for daily Bible readings. Like many other Paiutes in Nevada's multi-ethnic laboring class, Wavoka took the family name of his employer, thus Wilson. By the time he made his fateful journey to the mountains, Jack Wilson was in his mid-thirties, a big, affable man. He earned a modest wage tending cattle, cutting alfalfa, and stringing barbed wire. White and Indian alike invariably described him as hardworking, friendly, good-humored, and kind. With his beloved wife and children, he was living in a wikiup and spoke little English. He seemed destined for a life of obscurity. This is a, photo, a photograph of Wilson with another man. Wilson is seated. You can tell that the drawing that I showed earlier was based on this photograph. But not long after he returned from heaven, travelers from afar, following rumors of this new prophet, began to appear at his door. Desperate to regenerate the too soon dead and the corrupted earth, they proved eager disciples. Through them, the dance spread east. Within a year, across the Rocky Mountains and out onto the Great Plains, Lakota Sioux, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Kiowa, and others world its sacred circle. This is a map compiled by one of the first government reports about the phenomenon of the ghost dance. Uh, and you can see this red dotted line Uh, 
in this period of the early 1890s, late 1880s, early 1890s. By 1890, Wilson was known across Indian country as a prophet, the father. Some said he had met Jesus. To others, he was the Christ. Among the recently defeated Lakota Sioux, who had vanquished Custer only 15 years before, dancers wore painted muslin shirts alleged to be bulletproof. This is a photograph of the so-called ghost dance shirts, which became characteristic of the ghost dance as it was performed at Pine Ridge in South Dakota. They were not characteristic in Nevada. Partly for this reason that, that among the Lakota, the, the ghost dance was turned into, it became a, a dance that had more militant trappings uh, than it had in Nevada. Partly for this reason, many suspected Wilson of leading an uprising. Among his own northern Paiute, though, the ritual was peaceful. Given how much his teachings borrowed from Christian gospel, I think you could tell in that vision he has uh, where he goes to heaven and meets God, uh, that this is a man who has had considerable exposure to, exposure to Christian teachings and that he has, in fact, seized the, his spiritual life through those teachings, in part. And given how Wilson's instructions to, that his people should work for white people and forego war, you might even say the dance was, a conserv was conservative. The northern Paiutes called it simply dance in a circle. Shoshones named it Everybody Dragon, after a children's game it resembled. To the Caddo's, it was the dance with clasped hands, and Comanches knew it as the Father's Dance. But among the American public, it assumed a more haunting title, by which we know it still, the Ghost Dance. Today, the Ghost Dance is one of only a handful of Indian rituals whose name is recalled by the American public. For authors and filmmakers, Wilson's vision often serves as a preface to events on the Great Plains, where the panic over the ghost dance, or as the press often called it at the time, the Messiah craze, uh, brought on a massacre at Wounded Knee Creek, in which dozens of ghost dancer men, women, and children fell before the rapid-fire Hotchkiss guns of the 7th Cavalry on a winter morning in 1890. These are photographs that were taken at the time of the Wounded Knee Massacre, the mass grave at Wounded Knee. These were turned into postcards, which you could buy and, and, send, and send to people. Uh, the, the context here is, in 1890, uh, there was such a panic in the nation's press about what the ghost dance meant, about the potential for an Indian uprising in the West led in particular by the Lakota Sioux, who were famed for having defeated Custer, uh, the, the army was sent to deal, to put down, or contain the ghost dance in South Dakota, and the massacre at Wounded Knee was one of the results of that. Among the bullet-riddled, frozen corpses of a defeated people, the saga of the ghost dance ends, or so we are told. According to various accounts, when his millennium didn't show, Jack Wilson was revealed as a fraud, or chastened into silence, or he faded into insignificance. The story of Jack Wilson and the ghost dance has become a tragedy of doomed primitivism, the death rattle of the Indian Wars. It's that moment in our popular consciousness, that moment when one moment of history, the frontier, ends, and modern America begins. And in every treatment of the ghost dance, uh, that I've seen in history books, or almost every treatment, the ghost dance marks the end of that frontier period. Uh, there's one very famous account of the life of Jack Wilson uh, that was published in the 1950s that ends by saying Jack Wilson died in obscurity, uh, that his today, if you can find his grave at all, uh, it's an untended grave beneath a faded wooden marker, uh, and he's clearly been forgotten. Well, I visited Jack Wilson's gravesite in the summer of 2006. Um, that's a wrought iron surround there with two benches. That's Jack Wilson uh, buried next to his wife. And you can see um, fresh flowers. Uh, you can see the, the shells. And in the, there are also all kinds of offerings placed on this grave. There's money, coins, uh, bullet cases, 30-30 cartridges quite often, 
Uh, Jack Wilson was a great hunter and, uh, and was renowned as such. And you can also see uh, all the footprints of the little animals that, that come to visit that cemetery at Walker River. As you can tell here, what I'm suggesting is that rather than this story of the death rattle of the Indian Wars and the fading into obscurity of Jack Wilson, the truth, the truth of the ghost dance is stranger and more revealing. The ghost dance did not die on the Great Plains. Elements of it appear to have moved into northern Mexico, and this is something I'm, I'm investigating. This, this talk, I should mention, is for a book that I'm just starting to, to do the research on in a lot of ways. And so a lot of the comments I'm going to make tonight are suggestive rather than conclusive. Uh, elements of the ghost dance appear to have moved into northern Mexico, where peasant insurrectionists in the Tomochic Rebellion of 1892 donned bulletproof clothing. Elsewhere in the United States, from the Southern Plains to the Pacific Northwest, the dance was still practiced as late as the 1960s, and in altered form it, persists, it, it persisted long into the 20th century. Among the Sisseton Sioux of Canada, the ghost dance was the foundation of the New Tidings Congregation, an alternative Christian church which persisted until the 1970s. And if you visit the, the website of the Walker River Paiute Indian Tribe, um, which I, I visited the website um, just recently, and I haven't been able to talk to anybody at Walker River uh, about this history yet. I, I'm, that is one of the things I'm intending to do. It's very important, I think, to go talk to the people who come from this community. But on the website, uh, they, they talk about and mention that they've been doing the ghost dance again since 2005 at Walker River. And what that means, I'm not really certain. But clearly, clearly, this story didn't end with those mass grave, that mass grave out in South Dakota. Wilson himself never stopped believing in the millennium he predicted. To be sure, the massacre at Wounded Knee horrified him, and he apparently stopped teaching the dance after 1890. I say apparently because there are even some accounts of him teaching it to people after that, although it's, it's really not clear how much we can believe those accounts. But historians of the ghost dance have often overlooked how Wilson continued to pursue elements of his vision practically until his death in 1932. Key to his efforts was a promise of a fully restored earth, which was at the very center of his ghost dance teachings and which remained a feature of his work as a healer and teacher for the rest of his life. As various Wilson disciples explained to investigators later on, the ghost dance would, if it was done properly, the, the prophecy was the ghost dance would enlarge the earth, make it bigger. And this would replicate the prophet's vision of heaven, of a pleasant land and full of game, critically, with room enough for all good people. And depending on who you talk to and who you interviewed, some of the versions said it was just for Indian people, and others said, no, it was for all good people, Indian and white. Despite the failure or the delay in the prophecy's fulfillment, Wilson's, shaman, Wilson's shamanic powers left his followers with no doubts about his ability to control natural forces and relieve suffering. Over the years, witnesses would recount his magic, how he brought rain in time to save the jobs and crops of his people in 1890. The day he made a block of ice fall from the clear blue sky before a crowd of stunned onlookers, and how he could make wind blow to punish the selfish or the cruel. To his supporters, such mastery made his promise of a new earth all the more credible. And one of my points here is, uh, one of the points I'm trying to make with this book, is that I think Jack Wilson is speaking to the longings not just of Indians, but to white people in the West as well. Uh, Nevada and the West endured a terrible drought in 1889 and 90. Uh, and there's a famous account of the Paiutes at Walker River uh, suffering in this drought. Some of them owned a few cattle, um, and the, the cattle were suffering terribly. And when one of them approached Jack Wilson and said, why don't you do something to save us? Uh, within days, a huge snowstorm blew in and deposited lots of moisture. One of the ranchers in Nevada joked with Wilson, if you can make it rain, I'll give you two beeves. And it rained two days later, and the rancher sent two beeves over, supposedly as a joke. 
Uh, but I'm really not certain when you're a rancher and the drought is that bad, right? I think you, you go with what works on the rain front. And uh, if Jack Wilson could make it rain, then he certainly deserved two beeves. In any case, uh, these, this kind of concern about the failure of the settlement project in Nevada in particular uh, was something that was very much on the minds of Nevadans, white Nevadans, as, at least as much as Indians. Uh, let me give you uh, some other examples. Nevada's population was falling precipitously by 1890. Nevada had become a state, as you all know, during the Civil War, uh, partly because Lincoln was concerned that he wouldn't get reelected without three more electoral votes. Uh, so he got, Nev basically it was a campaign to make Nevada a state, but it only qualified for statehood by having more than 50,000 non-Indian residents. Well, those 50,000 non-Indian residents came because of the Comstock load and the big mines uh, in northern Nevada. Those were played out by 1890. The population of Nevada was falling, and it had fallen below 50,000. There was serious talk in Congress that maybe since we've, Nevada has fallen below 50,000 in population, it should become a territory again. It should move backwards, in other words, in the course of history and be relegated to the frontier again. There's a great deal of hardship in Nevada in other quarters. Um, there's, there are plenty of Mormons in Nevada. And I'm going to be talking about this, this episode a little bit further on in the talk. But just to highlight it, these are polygamists, Mormon polygamists in prison in this very famous photograph. We're actually talking about it uh, over dinner. Uh, the only photograph I know of these men who've been arrested for violating the new federal laws against polygamy. Uh, in, by 1890, of course, the church is on the verge of abandoning polygamy, and this creates enormous strain, I think, among Mormon settlements in Nevada. There's a great sense that possibly the church is at an end or the end times are upon us. Uh, there is a sense, in other words, among various different quarters in Nevada, Mormons, non-Mormons, Indians, that the land is giving out. And there is a, sh a turning, I think, to millennial visions for support when that land gives out. Remember that U.S. policy in this period was to crush Indian traditions, languages, and life ways. Laws took away Indian ancestral lands, banished their children to English-only boarding schools, outlawed their religions, barred them from fishing, hunting, and gathering, and imposed new standards of marriage, divorce, and family. Wilson's mingling of Indian and white forms in religion, dress, and other areas then expressed his energetic innovation in carving out space for himself and his people. His lifelong effort, I think, was partly to bring forth a world where Paiute culture could survive in the face of the aggressive assimilation policies of the United States. That's Jack Wilson in Yarrington, Nevada in 1915. Again, that, that big hat which is, is, is his trademark. Just as the ghost dance vision of Wilson mixed elements of Christian and Paiute religions to promise salvation, in the years after 1890, Wilson, like many other Indians, devised a politics that accepted some American demands and rejected others as he battled for the autonomy and culture of Paiutes, particularly their efforts to acquire and maintain land and to assert home rule on their reservations. In addition, and most famously, he became a healer, for which he remained an honored figure among Indians far and wide. On at least two occasions, in 1906 and again in 1916, he traveled to Oklahoma to discuss his revelations with followers. In 1924, Tim McCoy, Hollywood actor and director, uh, he was filming a, a movie called The Thundering Herd near Bishop, California. At the request of his Arapaho cast member, McCoy drove across the state line and returned with Wilson, who spoke to the cast about brotherhood, peace, and clean living before sitting down to a feast in his honor, followed by a dance. Almost until his death, his reputed powers brought in Indian visitors from across the country, including many ghost dancers, some of them wounded knee survivors, whose faith in him apparently remained undiminished. And Indians wrote him letters, hundreds of them. Wilson, who was illiterate, answered this correspondence with the help of a white friend, a man named Ed Dyer, 
who was a Nevada storekeeper, who spoke Paiute. Many supplicants wrote to Wilson to request red ochre paint or magpie feathers, and in keeping with their traditions, petitioners readily gave a fee, a gift, in exchange for the promise of health, and Wilson made a small living from this mail-order medical practice. Among other requests, correspondents often asked for some article of Wilson's clothing. Some requested that they, to have the large cowboy hat or sombrero he typically wore. As Dyer recalled, I was very often called upon to send them his hat, which he would remove, remove forthwith from his head on hearing the nature of a request in a letter. Wilson charged $20 for his hat and bought replacement hats from Ed Dyer. Dyer would say, although I did a steady and somewhat profitable business in hats, I envied Wilson his markup, which exceeded mine to a larcenous degree. But somehow, this very human trait made him all the more likable. If Jack Wilson's story illuminates for us how durable and pragmatic the ghost dance actually was, and how it allowed its prophet to meet the challenges of his day, the nation's response to the so-called ghost dance emergency also reveals keys to its real significance, not only for the history of Indian people, but for the history of the United States. How did the visions of an obscure man in the high desert of Nevada captivate so many people? What did the ghost dance mean to the people who danced it? And what did it mean to the American public? Indeed, how do you account for American hysteria over a peaceful gospel which showed not only considerable debt to Christian teaching, but which many white Americans, even at the time, considered a genuine Christian revelation? And finally, what do the ghost dance responses of Americans, from government officials to private individuals, tell us about American history at the end of the 19th century? The book I'm writing explores these questions partly by focusing on Jack Wilson, but I also focus on the man who, in a sense, undertook to resolve many of these same mysteries at the time. Three years to the day after Jack Wilson's visit with God, on New Year's Day, 1892, James Mooney arrived at Walker River. Mooney was an investigator for the United States Bureau of Ethnology, a division of the Department of Interior created to deploy the new science of ethnology, or anthropology, to sharpen government Indian policy. The Army massacre at Wounded Knee had given the government a black eye that would last for generations. Mooney's job, in part, was to analyze the causes of the ghost dance to avoid a repeat of such massacres. Uh, one way of looking at this is to say that when the ghost dance erupts, when people begin to say there's something big going on in Indian country, the government does two things. It does one very old-fashioned thing. It sends the army to deal with the problem. That, by 1890, is very old-fashioned, and it ends in disaster. But then they do something very modern. They send an anthropologist to Nevada to find out what's going on. It's easy to see Jack Wilson and James Mooney as opposites. Wilson wanted to save some form of Paiute culture. Mooney thought, he really thought when he went out to Nevada, that he was helping to destroy Paiute culture and Indian culture. Indeed, as a scientist, Mooney represented a new force for change in the West, a region which was beset by the failures of laissez-faire economic policies and poised for a new class of professional managers who would rely on science to secure the region's elusive bounty. Recurrent drought and economic depression sowed seeds of political unrest across the region, and nowhere more so than in that western subregion that was Jack Wilson's homeland, the Great Basin. And again, that map of the Great Basin just to situate us again. This is the most desolate region of North America. And remember, and it really is, really is, uh, our, I mean, archaeologists can tell you that it is easier, as a, as a hunter and gatherer, gatherer, it would be easier to find food in the Mojave Desert, which is off to the south of the Great Basin in California, and, and, uh, and we're basically south and, and a little bit to the west. It's easier to find food there than it is over most of the Great Basin. Uh, food is really difficult to find. It's a very difficult place to survive. Uh, remember that at this time, it had been carved principally into one state, and an adjoining territory. Uh, the state, of course, was Nevada, and the territory was Utah. 
The U.S. The government declared the, front, declared the frontier closed in 1890, but that seemed no sure thing in the Great Basin. The Mormon control over Utah, at the time they would have said polygamous Mormon control over Utah, and the arid climate and declining population of Nevada kept this region in a, in a, in a state of what we might consider sort of constant upheaval. There is a vision of American progress that the West was the wilderness and it's supposed to become a garden. The Great Basin is a place that is dramatically refusing to become the kind of ordered, well-regulated garden with rule by, by states, state governments. All of those sort of standard things that you'd expect from progress seem to be in doubt in the Great Basin. In a way, this, these forces tore a hole in the vision of American progress that had inspired frontier conquest and contributed so to the nation's sense of purpose in the aftermath of the Civil War. In a lot of ways, when I talk about the hole in the dream, uh, the Great Basin represents a kind of hole in the American dream of frontier conquest at this moment. By 1892, scientific expertise and new kinds of regulation were emerging as one set of tools to repair, or at least paper over, this hole in the frontier dream by engineering irrigation systems to water the deserts of Nevada and Utah, guarding forests to guarantee their yield, regulating rangeland, teaching new methods of farming and ranching in the state universities, and studying rather than slaughtering Indian peoples, many in the government hoped to ensure a brighter day in the still troubled West, and to employ these lessons too in the East, where immigration and industrialization threatened to turn American society upside down um, this is, a, of course, a scene uh, of the Great Basin, which you'll all be familiar with. That's actually from, from western Utah, not an untypical scene uh, of this landscape. But just to give you other images of the changes that were going on in the west and in the east at this time that create lots of popular anxiety, an enormous amount of deforestation in Nevada. That's Schooner Ridge near Lake Tahoe. And you can see they've clear-cut the forest for lumber uh, for the Comstock load. There's an enormous amount of erosion uh, and loss of lots of game and other food species for Indian people. And just about, uh, the land had been so overgrazed by cattle ranching at this time, uh, there's enormous cattle death in 1889 and 1890 when Jack Wilson is having his visions of a renewed earth. Ranchers are losing thousands upon thousands of cattle that winter from starvation. This is uh, a scene of the Haymarket bombing in Chicago in the 1880s. Remember, there's a huge amount of labor unrest in this period, and much of the laboring force in the United States is new immigrant labor. There's a great sense that America, uh, that, that with these millions of immigrants coming into the country, that the cities have become their own polyglo polyglot frontiers of lawlessness. That's Pittsburgh around 1900. And that for many people, the only way to move America forward and to keep order and to continue to dream of progress was to apply science. Science would be the key to holding this rapidly modernizing, increasingly polyglot, industrialized, and environmentally overstretched America together. Yet, if primitive ghost dancers and modern scientists seem diametrically opposed, Jack Wilson and James Mooney also shared certain goals and assumptions. In believing that his studies would help to usher in a new era of global harmony, uh, in fact, that's what anthropologists believe. If we just studied each other enough, they believe this at this time, not anymore. But if we studied each other enough, we'd get to understand each other, and then we wouldn't have any more wars. Uh, there was a time in James Mooney's life when he, he believed that. In that sense, we could say that Mooney's millennialism could rival Wilson's. More generally, scientists in the 1890s had an uncertain relation to questions of spirit. And when you think about this meeting between the prophet and the social scientist, they seem so different. One's dealing with spirit, one's dealing with rationality. But even before Jack Wilson visited heaven, prominent scientists, psychologists, and forensic specialists, including Sigmund Freud, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and William James, had founded associations for what they called psychical research, purportedly a new branch of science to study the, to study spectral apparitions, or ghosts, as well as a host of other paranormal phenomena, including hypnosis and telepathy. Indeed, the popularity of seances 
and other means of contacting the spirit world soared in this decade, which saw the apogee of the mystical American Theosophical Society and more popularly, the invention of the Ouija board. That's the first Ouija board in the 1890s. Uh, and it was first commercially produced Ouija board. And you can see the Ouija board becomes uh, a kind of icon of middle class fun in a lot of ways, although it's always a little bit of suspect fun. That's a Saturday evening post cover from the 1920s. What I'm trying to make, uh, the, what I'm trying to say here, the argument I'm trying to make here with these images of the Ouija board uh, and this talk about psychical research, scientists studying ghosts, is that the boundaries between science and religion are contentious, but they're never clear. And in this era, they were profoundly muddied by the question of ghosts in the afterlife, a characteristic which may have contributed to the popularity of the English name for Wilson's ritual, the ghost dance, despite the fact that no native group, uh, no native people seem to have called it that. If the ghost dance expressed the widely shared longings of native peoples for autonomy in an age of increased globalization and increased modernity, scientists seem to express their own dissatisfaction with their own rationalism by pursuing questions of spiritual meaning in so-called scientific investigations. James Mooney himself was certainly drawn to the ghost dance in part because it evoked in him a powerful sense of his own alienation from modern American society. He was a slight man, only five feet four inches tall. Standing next to Jack Wilson, he must have looked diminutive, but he cut a dashing figure. He carried uh, and dressed in black tailored suits with his large pockets for his, that he had specially tailored to accommodate the notebooks he always carried with him. His origins provide clues not only to his fascination with the ghost dance, but also to the meaning of the dance for Americans who faced the close of the frontier and the dawn of a new century. Mooney was the son of impoverished Irish immigrants. A Catholic raised on a diet of Irish poetry, he grew up a romantic and an Irish nationalist. His sympathy with the ghost dance in part expressed his ambivalence about US Indian policy, which to his mind too closely resembled British policy towards Ireland. His investigation of the ghost dance began late in 1890, as the dance swept the plains and alarmed the newspaper reading public. Mooney went first to the Southern Arapaho Reservation in Indian Territory, today's Oklahoma, where he danced the ghost dance alongside the Southern Arapaho and asked a barrage of questions about its meaning. He was one of the first ethnologists to employ the camera, and these are photographs of Arapaho ghost dancers some of whom had learned the dance from Jack Wilson in Nevada the year before. These are photographs that Mooney took. There is a... It was these photographs that Mooney would take out with him to meet when he met with Jack Wilson in 1892. And it's the photographs of these familiar disciples and Mooney's own account of dancing with them that persuaded the prophet to answer the ethnologist's probing questions. Mooney's early brand of participant observation and careful attention to ghost dance theology paid off with his masterpiece, The Ghost Dance Religion and Sioux Outbreak of 1890 which he published in 1896 and which soon became far and away the most popular publication of the Bureau that employed him. To this day, it remains the classic account of the origin, meaning, and practice of the ghost dance, and it is still required reading in university classrooms. It was, in many ways, a scientific government report without seemingly dispassion, I have to say. Mooney saw the ghost dance as a, as a product of deeply troubled Indian societies who were overwhelmed by poverty and therefore vulnerable to radical teachings like those of the nearby Mormons. Indeed, he concluded that Nevada Mormons had encouraged the ghost dance and had actually joined Paiutes in performing it. Now, in the 1890s and, and before, it's of course standard American fare to blame Mormons for just about any potential problem with Indians. 
and this is a standard thing, uh, General Nelson Miles uh, and Richard Henry Pratt and others would, to the end of their days, say that it was Mormons who created the ghost dance and got the Indians to do it and thereby caused all these problems. That's clearly unfounded and is based on anti-Mormon prejudices. But all that said, remember that it's at this moment that Mormons in Nevada are in a millennial crisis of their own, that the church has declared, as I've already mentioned, an end to polygamy in the United States. Many believe their church was ending, and suddenly news comes that Christ has appeared among Indians. And it fulfills that one of the prophecies of Joseph Smith, or at least it seems to, uh, Joseph Smith had said that when Christ returns, he will return first among Indian people. And it's at this moment when the church is in, is in uh, when there's such a moment of high tension in the church, that news comes of Christ appearing among the Indians. There are accounts from Indian people, there's a, there's a Cheyenne account, uh, where an army officer had learned that a Cheyenne man had been out to meet with Jack Wilson. Um, and this is in Montana. And he catches up with this Cheyenne man and he sits him down to interrogate him and says, tell me about this Indian who pretends to be the Christ. And he says, I, I don't know uh, why you're asking me these things uh, because you know already that Christ has come. He's come and he's in the back. And you know this because there's so many white people dancing the dance with the Indians. Uh, and it appears that he's talking about some Mormons who may have joined in with these dances. There are these tantalizing hints, but we just don't know uh, how, how true they are or how widespread uh, that, that uh, phenomenon was. For the dancer's spiritual beliefs, the ghost dancer's spiritual beliefs, Mooney had little time. Mooney took Wilson's testimony, as he put it, with several grains of salt. To him, the prophet's disciples seemed irrational and superstitious, and the powers they attributed to him were in reality proof of his hypnotic methods. As far as Mooney was concerned, the miracles that Wilson performed were all illusions. But the force of Mooney's romantic idealism, this is Mooney later in life, and his family history opened fissures in his smooth scientific facade. He was searing in his indictment of the reservation system. More controversially, he questioned the dominant rhetoric of American progress. The wise men tell us the world is growing happier, he began the study of the ghost dance. But deep in our hearts, we know they are wrong. When a people lie crushed and groaning beneath an alien yoke, how natural is the redeemer, the dream of a redeemer, an Arthur. I point out he's, Arthur was the Celtic king who defeated the Saxon invaders of Britain. Arthur's kind of an Irish hero to James Mooney pointing out that the Old Testament's King David expressed his faith by leaping and dancing before the Lord, Mooney so favorably compared the ghost dance with so-called civilized religions, including Christianity, that even he feared he would be censured. In most quarters, though, Mooney's book was surprisingly well-received. Still, his sympathy with ghost dancers earned him powerful enemies, including Richard Henry Pratt, who was the founder of the Carlisle Indian School and a powerful voice in Washington in the making of Indian policy, Pratt and, the, and other opponents, opponents would bide their time, waiting for a chance to strike with this renegade scientist whose defense of savagery they could not abide. For now, Mooney's ghost dance investigation made him famous and it launched him on a career as one of the foremost Indian schol or foremost scholars of Indian religion. He made many forays, mostly to the Great Plains, to study Indian religion. He learned to speak Indian languages and wrote up his research results in the study of his Washington, D.C. home. Occasionally, some of his Indian contacts and friends draw, uh, would stop by during their official visits to Congress or the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And after dinner with Mooney, his wife, Ione, and their six children, Mooney and the, the, these guests would retire to his study to talk and play the drums he collected on his travels and sing together. Mooney was a very private man. Um, and the neighbors knew him as this very serious guy who wore dark suits and sometimes there's a heavy bass beat coming from next door, so they decided he must be a German musician. The ghost dance and all that followed propelled the ethnologist away from the era's popular beliefs in monolithic white Christian civilization, and his willingness to accept alternative religions grew. During his research on the Southern Plains, among the Kiowa, he learned that the ghost dance accompanied and often complemented the rituals of the secretive peyote cult. Eventually, his close observation and, yes, participation in peyote ritual 
led him to the conclusion that this cult was in fact a valid form of Christian devotion. And in 1918, James Mooney helped to draft the charter for the newly formed Native American Church, in which the peyote ritual became a bona fide Christian sacrament. In this way, here's a, a Native American church in Texas, a church that exists today. In this way, Mooney's work pointed increasingly, to, increasingly towards what his contemporary and associate Franz Boas, uh, the great anthropologist at Columbia, would call cultural relativism, and towards the tolerance we know today as a bedrock virtue in a pluralistic society. Rather than th saying that Indian religion should be stamped out in their entirety and that Indians should accept just sort of Protestant Christianity or some kind of blanket form of Christianity, Mooney starts to say that any way that Indians want to approach Christianity should be allowed to them. And the peyote cult is a valid form of religion, he says. His timing, though, couldn't have been worse. His career had begun as authorities looked for ways to avoid a repeat of the Wounded Knee Massacre. It ended as the U.S. lurched toward World War I, the greatest massacre in history. Steeled for the slaughter of the Western Front, whipped into a wartime hysteria which condemned virtually all minority opinions and some majority ones, the American public went manic for assimilation. This is a 1919 newspaper cartoon. Um, the caption is, uh, we can't digest the scum. Uh, and you can see America is the world's best. Any kind of dissent against majority opinions could earn you the label of being un-American or a Bolshevist. The fierce conformity of the war and its aftermath inspired the nation's first Red Scare, deportations of American citizens and the renewed oppression of trade unionists, birth control reformers, and almost everyone else who challenged the status quo. As Mooney soon discovered, a nation which had just amended its constitution to prohibit alcohol uh, they drew up the, the, the amendment that banned alcohol passed, was ratified the same year that Mooney was drawing up the charter for the Native American church. That nation would take a dim view of hallucinogens like peyote. There was precious little room for the kinds of acceptance for alternative religions that Mooney was promoting. His support for the peyote faithful made him the focus of suspicious politicians, and near the end of his life, just as he believed himself to be on the verge of writing a masterpiece of peyote scholarship, old adversaries who had never forgiven him his ghost dance sympathies, including Richard Henry Pratt, succeeded in dragging him before hostile congressional committees, with the result that Mooney's superiors barred him from ever returning to in an Indian reservation again. In other words, they banned him from further research in the field. Along with Franz Boas and other anthropologists, Mooney would spend his final days in valiant defense of his views on religious and cultural pluralism. He died in 1921. Jack Wilson's prophecy thus fired Mooney's ethnological imagination and jump-started his career. It launched him on a course to embracing divergent religious traditions and even more becoming their spokesman. It inspired his greatest work. But ultimately, by entering the door it opened for him, he became a pariah. The ghost dance, in a sense, made and then unmade James Mooney's career. And yet, Mooney appears to have been nothing if not grateful for the opportunity to have worked among Indians and to have learned their resilience. He spent his waning days as a stalwart warrior, alongside Franz Boas and others whose work was censured in this period, battling for the freedom to pursue intellectual inquiry wherever it led. He would say a scientist must be allowed to follow the truth. If we cannot follow the truth where it leads us, the whole purpose of civilization is bankrupt. The ghost dance, in other words, led Mooney and many others towards acknowledgement of cultural pluralism and defense of intellectual freedom. Jack Wilson's vision helped lead them to see the world anew as a place of many cultures, a bigger, and dare we say it, a newer world. And Jack Wilson? Well, late in life, the ailing healer told his followers not to worry, that when he died, he would shake the earth to let them know when he reached heaven. He passed away in September 1932. Three months to the day after he died, a powerful earthquake rattled northern Nevada. There was joy among the Paiutes of Walker River, and among Wilson's white friends too. 
Son of a gun, Jack, remarked one of his old employers. Said he was going to shake this world if he made it to heaven, and by God he did. Although Wilson couldn't know it, in a real sense, this long fight against the deadening hand of assimilation was at least partly won. Shortly after the earthquake in Nevada, another kind of earthquake shook the nation when Franklin Roosevelt assumed the presidency, ushering in the New Deal that would end the assimilation policies of his predecessors. I don't want to prettify what's happened in Indian policy since 1932. There's been a lot of terrible things. But after 1932, the government began to encourage Indians to govern their own reservations and to preserve their culture. The tolerance that James Mooney had learned among Indians, that he had urged on the public, was now official policy. Wilson and Mooney were not friends. They did not know each other well. After their meeting at Walker River, their paths diverged. They never met again and they never corresponded. But if the, events that burst the ghost, the, if the events that birthed the ghost dance led to their meeting, Wilson's revelation in many ways started both men down paths that would change their lives and in the end, change American society too. We can see how their personal concerns often reflected the broader experience of region and nation. In the end, both men envisioned a kind of multicultural America, very different from the monolith English speaking Protestant nation idealized by their contemporaries. In a sense, modern Americans who espouse pluralism as a social virtue carry on their teachings. The ghost dance has been decoded at the end of many stories of the frontier and Indian autonomy, but I think it's much more interesting. We see it as a point of beginning. By following the entangled stories of Jack Wilson and James Mooney, we can connect the ghost dance to the local crises that fomented it to the regional and national concerns that turned it into a much wider public crisis, and to its surprising results in pushing scholars and the American public toward greater Indian autonomy and a broader acceptance of divergent religions and cultures. The close of the frontier then saw this wholesale transformation, uh, transformation not only in Indian policy, but it also brought about an epical shift in American understandings of the nation's past and its future. What I'm talking about here is that the ghost dance, I think, brings on a kind of peculiarly American realization, uh, an American current of thought, somewhat fleeting, certainly marginal much of the time, that recognizes that difference truly is our nation's great strength. Wilson and Mooney saw the meeting of cultures within our borders as a good thing. To them, the entire nation was a kind of experimental board borderland that shouldn't and couldn't shy away from collecting the results of those meetings. Thank you.